Boa tarde a todos. Eu hoje vou falar um, inglês uh, porque os nossos hóspedes uh, para, para ser um, mais, mais perceptível, sim? Uh, mas bom, com alguns textos, algumas coisinhas em português também. Uh, mas logo. Okay. Muito obrigada. Uh, Boa tarde, professor. Muito obrigada, professora Maria Helena, por tudo, pela amizade e por esta, esta possibilidade de eu estar aqui convosco, que para mim é sempre um grande, grande prazer. Obrigada. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I today want to be a little bit um, provocative. Let's say, uh, I want to talk to you, um, maybe first come back to the title, um, to, so, uh, about scientific interpretations of the religious texts. A little bit in general, but also um, in specific about the pyramid texts and the coffin texts um, as well. Um, I would like to show you uh, how some um, interpretations influence our mind and how they change later. Hello. Interpretations. So, um, have you ever thought um, about this, how you are happy or if you are happy? Yeah. Let's imagine you, you get up in the morning and, and you think, well, that's a perfect day for me. I'm very happy. But, when you are British or when you are American, um, you think a little bit differently. When you are Polish and you say, Jestem szczęśliwy, that means something a little bit different than when the American says, I'm happy. I'm happy about this dream. The Polish wouldn't say so. There is an, a, a German saying, I am happy, aber glücklich bin ich nicht. That means, in a sense of um, being happy, I am happy, but profoundly, I am not happy. Um, I know it, it's, it's being a little bit tricky at the moment, but, but I will try to explain to you how analyzing the language itself can change perception. If you are a person from the cultural group, a person using the language as your native language or from outside. Um, so it is very, it is assumed that the power uh, of religious the religions lies not in clarity of the language but in its ability uh, to engender strong effective emotional reactions. This leads to intuitive thinking in place of discursive one. That means when we are analyzing the religious texts, we as scholars, we try to understand them. And that's the biggest problem. Because I remember very well when I started to uh, study the pyramid texts, all of my tutors in Poland said, well, but you know, it's somehow not to understand. It's contradicting itself. You have this spell and just um, at the side you have a different one which is something completely different. And I thought for myself, impossible, that these texts have to have meaning. It has to be a comprehensive guide or something very useful for the pharaohs if they decided to put it on the walls in their tombs. And um, thus it started and thus I thought how to come closer to the meaning of the text. It's somehow if we are talking about religion, about the religious text, it's somehow impossible to understand it profoundly and understand everything because we quite often forget that the religious texts are not myths. They are not methodolo mythological texts. They tell us about the faith. They'll tell us this what was 
really believed by the ancient Egyptians. Of course, we can reverse it. I mean, we can say, okay, there was a, a council of um, priests. They created the text and put it on the wall. Well, but that's another perspective. But when we start to study, let's say, the Bible, for the believers, these texts are true. At least to some extent, you have relation of faith, of religion. That had to be the case of the pyramid text as well. And uh, um, this is what I, I'm going to, to do today, is to show you how the Egyptians liked their language and how much they used the language to, to achieve their aims and somehow to play with the reader as well. It is presumed that the religious texts, first of all the pyramid texts, were only for the king and with the exception of the queens. Um, so that means that they were written on the walls for them. Perhaps to be read, uh, to be read um, during funeral or after funeral, during rituals, but we don't know that. Nobody informed us about it, uh, so we can only suppose that it was so. Uh, we have some assumptions, some suggestions in the text which give us um, instructions what to do and how to do. But some of the texts uh, were composed probably just for the pharaoh and um, the queen. And I believe that they were to be read, read out, read loud. Um, why? I hope to show you in a minute. Um, just please, uh, um, because I'm speaking um, not to not only to Egyptologists, I have I will try um, to be as clear as possible. But um, do, do I have a point? If not, I will try to do it. Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Okay. Uh, so here you have marked some Egyptian words which are different. This one and this one, for example. We, we basically don't know how ancient Egyptian was pronounced. We know something, but it's still uh, very uncertain. And, but even though we don't know, we have, we, and when we try to read it in such a way Egyptologists do, um, we, st we find very well planned to my mind, sound effects. This is one of the examples. Um, there are even better ones, but much more difficult to, uh, to explain and, and to show uh, to people who cannot read um, hieroglyphs, because they are based uh, really on, on onomatopoeic effects. Um, and these are um, serpent spells. That, the, um, that means spells against serpents, uh, space, uh, spells, um, sp again, one more thing to explain, spell in sense of enchanting reality, spell not in a magical sense, because the pyramid texts, the religious texts are not magical texts. There are perhaps some elements of magic in it, but they are not magical in its sense, they are religious, which is, uh, for me, um, very different. So here you have Ka, and you have Ka, and Ka, and Ka, and Ka, and Ka again. For such a short piece of text, you have this Ka repeated, and, but it has different meanings, as you can see. Oh, Atom. Atom is creator girl, who is coming into being. When he became high as the mount, car, you rose up as the Benben in the mansion of the bird Benu in Yunu. You sneezed Shu, you spat out of Snoot, and you set your arms about them as the arms of Ka. That your essence, it's again Ka, might be in them. O Atom, set your arms, Ka, about the king, about this construction, 
and about this pyramid, as the arms of Ka again, that the king's essence, it's again Ka in Egyptian, may be in it, enduring forever and ever. That I'm absolutely sure that it was not by accident to put all of those ka, even though some of them are different words and mean different things, but um, this play on words, this play on sounds, um, was, was uh, well uh, planned, well thought by the Egyptians. And unfortunately, uh, I have, even though it was installed, uh, I don't have the transliteration font here, but this is a very good example how sometimes um, technical problems can change our interpretations uh, of the sources. Um, well, um, it, it was anyway just to show you a um, different way of our Egyptological interpretation. Because we have, uh, we have hieroglyphs, then we prepare transliteration, then we translate, and still you have lots of steps of interpreting the text. Um, that's why I uh, always say to my students how important it is to translate the text themselves. Okay. Because even a word, one word changed in your translation can change the understanding. And when we think about the ancient Egyptians, I would like to not only to show you, but to emphasize as well how they loved life. We almost always think about the Egyptians as about the culture of death, uh, because we associate it with the pyramids, with the tombs with, of any kind, with um, uh, mummies, with uh, um, every sort of things related to death. Um, death on the Nile or whatever, <laughs> but they themselves did it all to, to live, to endure forever and ever. As you can see, even in the pyramid texts, um, there are fragments like, as this one. How delightfully to see, how agreeably to behold, says Arsis. When this god ascends to the sky, his power upon him his terror around him, his magic at his feet. It shall be done for him by Atom, just as he used to do. The gods who are in the sky have been brought to him. The gods who are on earth have assembled for him, so they may place their hands under him, having made a ladder for him, that he may ascend on it to the sky. The doors of the sky are opened for him, the doors of the starry firmament are thrown open for him. What does it mean then? Is it just an image? But did they believe in it? I believe so. So if they say, if they pronounce, if they somehow influence reality, they pronounce that having made a ladder means really creating the ladder in this religious sense. I don't want to say that in all Egyptian texts uh, that function, but in religious texts it had to, to make them real. And as you can see in different examples, in, in the pyramid text we can observe um, at least some kinds of, um, let's say, religious style and some uh, um, grammatical as well as uh, stylistic changes to the language and when we are studying the religious text normally we study um, conventionalism, traditionalism and let's say some novelty if when we try to compare the pyramid text and the coffin texts the most um, common um, observation is that the pyramid texts, as the first texts, are more positive and then the coffin texts are more negative in the message. But um, well, I was talking about it um, you know, last week in Krakow um, at the conference and I hope um, I showed that this is not true.
both of them change the recipient because the pyramid texts were written for the king or for the queens and the coffin texts were much more open, were um, accessible for the elite. And then something changed for sure, but not perhaps so much as we tend to think. And uh, as I showed um, at my, uh, during my last lecture in Krakow, the message was so simple that in the pyramid texts, the main, um, let's say, actor was the pharaoh, and he was identified with the creator. But in the coffin text, as I will show you in a minute, something was a little bit different. But here you see ways of this what I call religious reality creation. That means you can use different moods to create this reality. It, as here, it can be just a description. Description of the reality. And then I will show you different ones. For they have seen the king appearing in power as the god who lives on, their father, on his fathers and feeds on his mothers. The king is a master of dignitary, whose mother does not know his name. The glory of the king is in the sky. His power is in the horizon. Like his father, Atom, who gave him birth, uh, who gave birth to him, although he gave birth to the king, the king is mightier than he. So this is one of the fragments of very famous cannibalistic um, hymn from the pyramid texts. And in the very beginning, it, it was interpreted as uh, the oldest, the most ancient part of the pyramid text because it contains uh, fragments where it is said about the pharaoh that he eats piece by piece. That he devours even piece by piece his ancestors and people he meets on his way. Unas is the great power who has power over the powers. Unas is the sacred image, who is most sacred of the sacred images. Whomsoever he finds in his way, he will devour piece by piece. Continuity is the lifetime of Onis. Everlastingness is his limit. In this his prerogative of if he likes, he does. If he dislikes, he does not which is at the limits of the upward forever and ever. And this is somehow the concept we were discussing yesterday at a dinner <laughs> with Helen Stradley, and I uh, totally agree that perhaps we are not understanding this concept of continuity and everlastingness. You can call it differently. Uh, you, you can speak um, differently about it. But yesterday, um, Helen said that perhaps when we are in a circle of eternity, and if the, um, if, if the way is long enough, it's linear, because we don't see the curve. So uh, it was just the same way of perceiving different things, um, different things actually, or the same thing, because people who lived on Earth they had this linear perception, which was somehow in circular eternity. It was inside of it. But here you have very tricky expressions. Okay, I said that the religious texts were to create reality, yes? So, what does it mean? That the pharaoh really met people on his way and he was dev devouring them. He was eating them. And that makes the text very old because somehow depicts the very ancient um, practices, rituals, 
cannibal rituals of the Egyptians? Not necessarily, of course. Even if it is creating a reality, it, it, it does it in a figurative way, in a symbolic way. That means it may be the description of the power of the king, of the king who, as it was said before, is mightier than his mother and his father. It's even said that he's older than his mother and father because he was created before a time. He was created before anything else existed. And here you have a different, um, different um, means to help realize or to create this reality. As I said, it could be descriptive. Descriptions of the reality of um, of the persona involved in the scenes, and this is what was happening. But sometimes, um, or in, a, um, in other words, it was very often that in the pyramid text there were uh, there was used an imperative mood, or to call them injunctions, commands to do something, and th these were commands, injunctions directed to the gods. So, normally, the Egyptians didn't ask, didn't pray in such a way um, we do. So please, God, give me this and that. They rather commanded, Atten, raise this onus up to you. Enclose him within your embrace, for he is your son of your body forever. It could be imperative mood or it could be usivus, which is quite difficult. For example, in Polish actually it's quite difficult to express both of them and to, to express differences between them. But there is a slight difference between um, imperative mood and the usivus, which is much more, um, it, which is a little bit less um, imperative um, in its sense. And again, um, this very spell was interpreted as a kind of um, comparison between the pharaoh, the king, and the creator Atom. Because it says, I will come back to, to the hieroglyphs um, in a minute, it says, O Unas, it is not that that, sorry, but a life that you have gone away. Sit upon the throne of Osiris. Your sceptre Abba is in your hand. May you give orders to the living. Mechus and your sceptre, um, I'm sorry, it, it, it again, um, something did not appear. Uh, this, this word uh, should be written uh, as this one, mm -hmm. if I, but I'm sorry. Um, because this is again just a transcription from, from the Egyptian. Uh, Mechas and your sceptre Nahabet are in your hand, so give orders to those whose seats are hidden. Your arms are those of Atom, your shoulders are those of Atom, your belly is that of Atom, your back is that of Atom, your hind parts are those of Atom, your legs are those of Atom. Your face is that of a jackal. Let the mounts of Horus serve you. Let the mounts of Set serve you. So as I said before, this text was translated, uh, before it was translated, uh, your arms are like Atom, or like those of Atom. What, what makes difference is this little M, which in Egyptian is called M of predication, and it was specifically used not to compare, but to identify. In a religious text, always it is used to identify one thing with the another. And it's a kind of instrumental construction, which was used, for example, in, in, um, uh, in fairy tales, 
as well, or in uh, uh, folk texts. For example, when I speak now, I, as a lecturer, think this and that, but I, as mother, can think something differently, can figure something differently. I can teach something, but I then, in reality, I can behave differently. I am a little bit different person in roles I assume during my life. And I believe that those stages were very important for the king. He assumed different forms, different manifestations via through this identification with different gods. First, it was the identification with the creator, but it goes even further because the Egyptians, um, again, this is an example of, uh, um, of um, injunction directed to the king. It, it is enough to say to the king, raise yourself, O king, for you have not died. And this starts the procedure. He commands new life, starts new life. And so coming back, uh, that is what, what I have said before. Um, it goes farther because the pharaoh who is identified with, um, with the creator, and I, um, I owe you one more explanation perhaps, because you have here a pharaoh who has all body parts, even the hind parts, which seems quite important in this sense, identified with the body parts of Atom. So, well, we could assume he becomes Atom, but then he has a jackal face. What is it? It, it seems so strange to us to understand that, to perceive how it functioned. But then, of course, a jackal was very often associated with the god Anubis, and uh, many scholars, or almost all scholars, understood it as somehow equaling the pharaoh with the creator and Anubis. But when I analyzed or all of the fragments in the pyramid texts which identify body of the king with the body of a tomb, then the face is always of jackal. It, here you have just one sign. And normally this sign of a lying mm, hound-like animal is associated with jackal. But okay, it would be, it could be um, probable or not, but in other cases, always it is written phonetically. It's written za, which means in Egyptian, jackal. And as you see, how um, people, if we do not have possibility to compare, to analyze all of the, um, all of the uh, fragments associated with this, what we are studying, how much we change our minds. You can say, okay, but Jackal and Anubis who has a Jackal face could be the same. Could be, but not necessarily has to be. Because Jackal has those aspects of being dangerous, of being the animal which, um, which, which should be avoided. Which should be avoided especially in the afterlife. What does it mean? Again, some scholars interpreted this fragment that the um, king now becomes a human with a mask of a jackal. But other texts, um, in the coffin texts, you have somehow explained that the king, uh, or in the, coffin, in the case of the coffin text, it's not the king anymore. Um, it can be the king, but not only. Uh, so the deceased becomes a god in his power to create and to 
to destroy. And you have this connection of, of creative power, of the creator atom and of jackal as a dangerous animal. And as I uh, mentioned before, it's identifications of the king or father, um, or maybe not really. Um, <laughs> that's again a point, a very important point. So the deceased, the pharaoh, is identified with the creator. But other text says, raise yourself, say they, in your name of God, become complete of every God. And when I was presenting this translation, everybody was just objecting, but you cannot say in English complete of every God <laughs> or any other languages. <coughs> it actually does not sound well. But what is in Egyptian? It is like Some of the scholars translated it as to become atom, but there is no verb to become atom or any other god. There is no verb to become Ra. And then if you try to understand what follows, it explains why you are complete of every god, of every characteristic other gods have. Your head is that of Horus, of the Dulat, O imperishable. Your face is that of Hanti Irti, O imperishable. Your ears are those of, of the, the twins of Atom, O imperishable. Your eyes are those of the twins of Atom, O imperishable. Your nose is that of the Jackal, O imperishable. Your teeth are those of Soptu, O imperishable. Your arms are those of Hap and Dua Motif, which you need to ascend to the sky and you shall ascend. So you see, if you have all those parts, you need them, you need them to do a thing, to, to perform an action, and you do, because you are complete. You are as complete as the Creator, which has in himself all the necessary capacities, all the characteristics to your legs are Imsati and Kebek Sanuf, which you need to descend to the lower sky and you shall descend. All your members are the twins of Atom, O imperishable, and even more, you shall not perish and your car shall not perish, you are gone. Again, we come back to the car I was talking about um, before. Car, what is car? Car is a part of the, of the soul, and again, it's not a very um, fortunate um, description, because for the Egyptians, the spiritual part of, of a human being um, consisted of several parts, like Ba, which was, which was imagined as a bird, like um, Ach, which was much more spiritual and dangerous entity, and Ka, which um, sometimes is translated uh, as being a, um, a kind of a twin of a deceased, but for me it is the essence of a human being which was transmitted by the gods to the king and then by parents to their children. That is, if, for example, the god was embracing, that is, doing ka, to, let's say, the pharaoh, he was kaing his ka to, um, to the pharaoh. And this is what the pyramid texts say. O oh, Osiris named himself Meren Ra. You are the essence, you are the Ka of all the gods. And you see, that's it. What we have, the creator, with such a funny face, um, but 
somehow it is this what the creator has in himself, what he comprises in himself. Different characteristics, different capacities, different powers to achieve the aim. But to achieve those aims, the king, the pharaoh, has to become the creator himself. And once again, just to show you quickly um, how the pyramid texts were constructing this reality. So if you say a stairway to the sky is set up for him, that he may mount up, uh, my, sorry, uh, may mount upon it to the sky, and he will ascend on the smoke of the great sensing. This king will fly up as a bird and alight as a beetle. He does fly up as a bird and alights, alights as a beetle on the empty throne which is in your bark or run. So, description. Again, description of the reality and it becomes somehow true. Or, you have, may you become, it is as Yusufus, may you come into being. It's not just come into being, imperative, but may you come into being with your father Atom. May you rise together with your father Atom. But again, this is our interpretation, this is our translation. And we, we cannot be sure if it was imperative or not. But here you have an imperative translation. Oh not, take his hand. Oshu, lift him up. Oshu, lift him up. Just to make it stronger. And this what I said about what I was um, speaking before. Um, this fragment was very strange to the scholars, um, not understandable, because the king says, I am back to back with those northern gods of the sky. There is even more, one um, more explicit where it is said, I turn my back to the gods. It is offensive, isn't it, in our culture, yes. But we cannot know how was it before. Especially um, when we think about this, what I said before, that when the god was behind the king, and when he was embracing, as for example in very famous statues of the kings, um, the one of um, um, uh, Catherine, um, where, uh, where the god Horus uh, sits, um, behind his head and embraces his head with uh, his wings, oh, its wings, his wings, because this is ours, okay. Um, and again, a very similar statue from Abu Sir, um, discovered by Czech mission, um, with much more simple, um, much simpler, but uh, the idea is the same, it's, it's protection. When the god is behind the king, it's protecting the king. It's not being offensive, but it's just um, being submitted to this protection. So I am back to back with those northern gods of the sky, the imperishable stars, and I will not perish. They who cannot grow fatty, I will not grow fatty. They who cannot pass away, I will not pass away. It's again identification, equality in some sense. And rituals which are present in the pyramid texts, it is enough to say, may you open his eyes, or just open his eyes for the king. May you break open his nostrils for him. May you split open his mouth for the king. May you unblock his ears for him and throw his plums for him, and so on. Ye say what happens, and it happens. And the king revivifies and uh, starts to breathe again, to eat again, and how, um, how amazing it is that the Egyptians did not only think um, in such a very simple way, but if they talk about eyes, opening the eyes, um, they say to see and to behold, or to see and to look. Or, or the other way around, I should have said. 
to look and to see. Yes, um, and how profound it was. And again, an imperative mood, be alive. There are fragments which say, dance, move, run, just to be alive. Be alive in this your name, which is with the gods and have appeared as Opio, one of the one of the gods, as a soul at the head of the living, as a power at the head of the spirits. And even more, there is no word against Unis on earth among people. There is no crime or accusation in the sky among the gods, for Unis has annulled the world. So he annihilated it, he destroyed it, and there is no more. It's enough for him to proceed to achieve uh, his goals. And just to, um, to come to the coffin text, um, as you may see, this is the same um, procedure, the same way of using the language to create reality. But if it's really the same, the same, we will see in a minute. May your heart be raised, may your heart live, may you possess your flesh, may you like, which is sort of tricky. And uh, somehow very similar with this, what I've shown from the pyramid text, if you like to do, you will do it. If you want to do it, you will do it. Um, and and again, pure ones, because of whom I will not die by slow death. I will not perish because of them. I will not perish instantaneously. See, my existence is created in this land of the living. I am their survivor. It is truly I who will exist in this land of the living. My will will create my limbs. You see, it, it's enough to have a will to create as the creator in the very beginning had to overcome the inertness of this stage between life on, the, on earth and life in the beyond. Um, the pharaoh is believed not to die as I, um, um, I, as I showed you. Uh, but what does it really mean? In the coffin text, it really changes. It changes in such a sense that it is said that the pharaoh and the de um, other deceased do not die the second death. What does it mean? The second death or the death among people? A second death is a permanent death. It's annihilation. It's this that when, it's, it's just a kind of the very, very beginning of the concept of, um, of the um, judgment of the dead. And when you come and when you are a bad person, speaking in a very simple language, um, you, you will be devoured by, by um, uh, great devourer, the Amit. And then you will disappear. You will disappear completely. And this is the main threat the deceased can have. But it was not um, it was it, it was not anyhow connected with the king, because the king was the god in the pyramid texts, because he was identified with the creator, so it was just said he cannot die among people, he cannot die as people die. Very, very um, explicitly. And again, you have this, what I was talking about, not dying a second death. It's, it's not dying again. But I said that the, the coffin texts uh, very often were treated as those negative or more negative uh, corpus. Why? For example, because of this passage, Ra and Atum are dead. Fire, fire, I have come, so that I may be mighty in your company. I am he who passes by and splits open darkness, and fire has no, no power over him as over anyone else.
belongs to the night. And yes, it is somehow true that um, Arten is less of active in the Coffin text. It, he, this spell and other uh, where it is said that Arten lies and his son Shu or the king as Shu acts. Does different or performs different activities to maintain life and even maintain life of Atom. It's not said so explicitly, but uh, some scholars thought it was so that Atom is dead and Shu, as his son, is trying to revivify him or just to continue. Um, somehow to make him come back um, and most of the scholars interpret as for example Harko Willems interpret um, those passages uh, called Book of Shu uh, from the Coffin text as description of those Otiosos, a god who was withdrawn who somehow created the world and just is just watching what's going on but actually, the coffin text show us, and again here you have an example of um, this contradiction to death. Um, other examples from the coffin text show us that actually this is what happens maybe just a very, very natural description of the order of the world, of nature, in simple words. That is, that the Father, the Creator, created the world and then, as naturally it happens everywhere, He passes, He bestows His creations, to his children and they continue and this is to me to my mind very visible in Egyptian text in religious text just to show a natural way the things are were developing if you wanted to stay on earth stay in a symbolic way you had to have children for the Egyptians it was very important they showed you had to transmit, you had to pass your car to a living being, to, to a human being. Because, okay, you could create, you could ask to build a tomb, you could write the text, but this could be destroyed. But in children, you stayed forever and ever with your car. slowly running out of time, so I will um, skip this, this part, <coughs> perhaps, and just showing you how um, this perhaps was functioning. I throve, I came into being before the sky was fashioned, and it gives me respect before the earth was fashioned, and it rejoices at me. While I look for your saliva and your spittle, they are Shu and Tefnu. And this again, you have here a reference to the creation of the world by Atom, and these are coffin texts. So it shows the natural way of, of procedure. But the deceased, even though he is not only the king anymore, because the coffin texts were written not only for the pharaohs, but even though the deceased becomes Atom, and he says, I have become Atom, it is well with me as Horus, and it is well with every god of whom I have experienced. You see how you have confirmation of this being essence of every god. If we do not understand this being complete of every god, if we do not study the whole context, 
it appears something very, very strange, at least. I have become Atom. It is well with me as Horus. You see? You, you are, you, it, if you try to read it um, verbatim, if you try to understand it as it's, as it's written, it's very difficult, truly, to understand. Um, I, well, just to, to be a little bit more provocative and to show you how, for me, the sources, the material sources, iconography and everything, what we have um, in opulence in Egypt and the texts are relative. Um, I, I, I want to, first, before I, um, I tell you what you see in the picture, I want to play a little bit with you. I will read you some excerpts, some fragments of text, and I would like you to tell me where from this text come, um, where uh, this text come from. That means uh, you don't have to give me a title, sure, but it, just tell me if it's. Um, um, a fairy tale, if it's a philosophical um, um, text, or uh, and and more or less uh, what century it comes from. Okay. She got to her feet, but that's what the word is all about, Jimmy. Stories, stories explain everything, bring everything together. Is it contemporary or not? Yes or not? Yeah. Yes. What kind of story is it? Do you know? I think I know. Sorry? I think I know, but I'm not sure. It's so difficult. You don't have the context, do you? Yeah. And let's say this one. Oh yes, this modern infidels appeal to the reason. But who can look at those millions of words and not feel that there may well be wonderful universes above us where reason is utterly unreasonable? Reason and justice grip the remotest and loneliness star. Look at those stars. Don't take um, don't they look as if they were single diamonds? Well, you can imagine any botany or geology you please. Think of forests of adamant with leaves of brilliance. Think the moon is a blue moon, a single subpile. But don't fancy that all that frantic astronomy would make the smallest difference to the reason and justice of conduct, on plays of opal, under cliffs cut of pearl, you would still find a notice board. Thou shalt not steal. Is it contemporary? Any guesses? Please. <laughs> what kind of text is it? It's an adventure story, or could be, or not. But actually, this is a detective story, a crime story. You see? And one more. Yeah, this one is a very important one. And please be very careful. Estes fenícios, que tinham transformado o grande mar na sua morada privilegiada, onde se motiv um, movimentavam com grande vontade. Não eram hábeis com as armas. A aventura do mar e a, a estreiteza do território acidentado, contido pelas montanhas e oriente, nunca permitiram que estes homens construíssem uma unidade política ou um sentimento nacional. 
Sim. <laughs> Parabéns. Isto, isto, this, this was done, um, um, of course, um, I wanted to be to be very tricky. And I was just observing um, Professor if she's... Because sometimes, even if you write a text, you not always recognise it later. Um, anyway, you see how difficult it is. I do it with my students. I just choose different fragments. I have a whole... Um, a whole um, a whole book of the text, uh, which I present to my students, out of the context. And you almost always say something completely different about the text. I have much more, but unfortunately we do not have time. And just to finish, um, I want to say that I try to be very modest when trying to understand um, the religious texts, the ancient religious texts. You can say, okay, we have so many difficulties, uh, so many obstacles, so then we should not study it. But for me, the language, grammar, style, and um, comparative studies of the text may be of help. And just um, to somehow sum up, I want to tell you a story about Joseph Campbell, who was, um, um, he was studying religion, he didn't want actually to be a scholar, somehow. Um, once um, he told a story that he um, has been in Japan at a conference, and um, he overheard a conversation one of one of anthropologists, American anthropologists, uh, with Japanese Shinto priest. And the American said, okay, we've seen a lot of your rituals, a lot of your temples and churches, but you know, I wonder, what is your religion all about? What is your philosophy? And the Shinto priest said, well, you know, I think we do not have a true religion. We do not have philosophy. We are dancing. And some elements of living in different languages just to terminate, to learn a language is to have one more window from which to look at the word. To learn a language. Uh, sorry, learn a language and you will avoid the war. Oh. Those who know many languages live as many lives as the languages they know. And I had um, another story which I unfortunately I think I cannot um, tell you because of lack of time. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So maybe next time. <coughs> and just to finish, finish. Many of you know the story about one of Egyptologists who um, finally, um, after years of studying Egyptian texts, um, found himself in the temple of Amun uh, in Karnak. And he met, uh, um, um, he met the priest of Amun, Ra, and he was telling him all of his ideas, all different ideas. And the priest was listening and he said, well, that's very interesting, but it never came to my mind. And as you can see here, sometimes, or maybe very often, we are over-interpreting. We are um, making the simple things very complicated. We are building, creating theories where it was quite simple. Thank you very much for your attention.